All right, great. So we're going to shift gears now um, to our panel. And the reason that we decided to have this panel, we're having the panel uh, discussion on uh, effective animal activism. And we, uh, you know, been doing this conference for, this is our fourth year. And last year in the feedback in those forms, oh, and a reminder about the surveys, please, please fill out your survey and give us your feedback. Uh, there's a box on the registration table that you can drop them on your way out. Uh, through that feedback, we had a lot of people saying, yeah, I know it's, it's horrible and I agree, but what can I do? I want to know more about what I can do to help. Um, and so we listened to that feedback and decided to have our panel discussion on um, that issue. And I'm not seeing uh, the stand with the mic. Oh, is that where it is? Hey, Sam. Hey, can, can that actually go up? Well, maybe I just wanted some place where there can be kind of a line. So what's going to happen is each panelist is going to, um, yeah, that's fine. Each panelist is going to um, speak for seven minutes each. And then we're going to open it up to discussion and questions. And so this is the microphone. And I might just pass it around instead of having um, a line, because uh, then people are over here. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but anyway, um, we will have our first speaker now. And it's Brian Burns of Direct Action Everywhere. Hi, everyone. So I'm Brian from Direct Action Everywhere. And here today, I'm going to introduce DXE's model for social change, create, connect, inspire. I'm going to talk about how DXE uses two often overlooked tools, community building and provocation, to overcome some of the most pressing problems that hinder effective and sustainable animal advocacy. But first, I want to introduce you to someone who you may know very well. <laughs> so who, who here has been the lonely vegan? Wow, so pretty much everyone. So I've been the lonely vegan. I think we can all say that being the lonely vegan really sucks for a few reasons. The first is that, of course, you're lonely. You have no community to support you. you know, the second is that you're afraid to speak up because you don't have any community to support you. And in fact, that community is often very much pitched against you. Um, and last, perhaps most unfortunate, there's a very large chance, uh, in fact, approximately 75%, that you'll quit veganism altogether. Um, the recidivism rates for veganism are awful. So we can see that this lonely vegan problem is, is a huge problem within animal advocacy. Um, but first, we should ask, why is it happening in the first place? Yale sociologist Nicholas Christakis has the answer. His research, in short, finds that community is the key determining factor in people keeping or changing their behaviors or beliefs. So let's take an example from some of his research, smoking. Christakis found that large advertisements are some of the grotesque images that you might see on these cigarette cartons, right? the, the cancerous, tar-filled lungs, actually are not very effective at changing people's opinions on whether or not they want to continue smoking. What he did find, however, was that close family connections, family and friends, had extraordinarily high impact rates. So he found, for example, that if you had a friend who was very uh, vocal about quitting smoking, your chances of doing the same would increase by 20%. Christakis has found the same for all other sorts of phenomena, from obesity to self-reported happiness. And the central finding is that community matters more than anything else. So this leaves a huge gap in the standard model of animal rights advocacy, which is typically large scale but shallow outreach. So for example, um, you know, mass, mass leafleting. So handing out as many leaflets as you can to maximize the number of vegans that you create, but not necessarily connecting one-on-one. -on -one. Another example is uh, promoting you know, uh, animal cruelty videos on the internet, but not necessarily trying to get those people after they watch the video to engage in some way with your group or your community. So these efforts are great at kind of initially motivating people to change their beliefs or behavior. But after that, you often get disappointing results. You get energetic vegans who stop showing up to your events or protests. You see people who stop speaking about the issue to family and friends. And worst of all, sometimes you get the occasional ex-vegan. 
So DXC, the group that I work with, has taken these lessons to heart. And we've launched community engagement programs called DXC Meetups and DXC Connections to implement the findings from successful social justice movements and social science research. So with DXC Meetups, we have weekly Saturday morning meetings in Oakland with coffee, vegan donuts, team building exercises, and communal activities like protests and potlucks. This builds a strong and loving network of animal rights activists in the Bay Area and allows previously lonely vegans like you or myself to come together and form a strong community. With DXC Connections, we build peer-to-peer -peer engagement by connecting triplets of activists in our network. We have them meet once every month and just show support for each other and chat. This creates the kind of the strong community bonds that uh, you know, influence the change in, in mental institutions that Nicholas Christakis talks so much about. And after implementing these programs, we found extraordinary success. So we found lower recidivism rates with people sticking around our events a lot more, and older activists who have quit uh, you know, coming to some of our programs have started to come back. Um, and most notably, we found that we've had much higher attendance at demonstrations and events. So we're regularly getting like 50 to 60 people at our demonstrations now. And in some cases, including in January, which is pictured here, we had 150 plus. Um, and our community space regularly is entirely full uh, during some of our more formal meetings. Um, so now that I've talked about community, I want to briefly discuss another problem facing animal rights act activists, perhaps the most insidious problem standing in the way of any social movement. And that's apathy. So in the animal rights movement, we do face a problem of ignorance. A lot of people just don't know what's going on with animals suffering animal farms. But in a large part, the problem we seek to overcome is also apathy. Uh, both people outside of the movement don't care about animals, but even within the movement, it's so difficult to get vegans and vegetarians who care about animals to do more, to start doing outreach, or to start doing activism. Right? So the good news is that in social science and social justice, this is a solved problem. And the solution is provocation and protest. So we're often told uh, to play nice and not be the angry vegan. But historically, provocation and protest have been extremely powerful tools for social justice. In fact, Sidney Tarot, who's a political scientist at Cornell, has called disruption the quote-unquote strongest weapon for social movements. So why does he say this? First is that provides evidence of determination. It shows that you and other activists care about this issue. The second is it obstructs routine and forces attention. So uh, you know, many of the routines that we daily engage with, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, involve routine violence against animals. So it's very important to draw attention to those normal, everyday evils and call attention to the fact that animals are suffering as a result. And finally, it broadens the circle of debate so that Animal rights becomes an issue of discussion not just within the animal rights bubble, but within the public at, at large. <coughs> so we've had extraordinary success with this as well in our flagship campaign, It's Not Food, It's Violence, which goes inside of restaurants and grocery stores and it, with a very simple message that animal flesh, meat, eggs, and dairy are not food, but products of horrible violence against animals. So in this campaign, we've uh, you know, in generated enormous public dialogue with 100 plus press outlets in just the last year, including the New York Times, Mother Jones, CNN, and Fox News. Um, and most importantly with the movement, we've inspired vegans to become activists, and we've empowered activists to further empower other activists, creating a, fo a positive feedback loop of change that has now spread to 110 cities in 20 different countries around the world. So to recap, social dispersion and apathy are insidious problems in the animal rights movement. They lead to a wide variety of failures, including vegan recidivism, weak messaging, and ins installed movement growth. But we can overcome these and turn them in our favor with a simple formula for social change. Create, connect, inspire. Create activists, not just path passive sympathizers or lonely vegans. Then connect those activists in empowered communities. And finally, inspire those activists to take collective action provoke public dialogue, and create more activists in the, last in the last chain of a positive feedback loop for change. So what I, what I want to end with is that you are part of that chain. We've had extraordinary success building community and utilizing provocation at DXE, but these tactics have only reached a fraction of, the, of who we'd like them to. 
So please, if you can, I'd love you to take part and witness these things in person. You can talk to me about this. You can reach out to any of the folks who are involved in DXE. <coughs> if you can, raise your hand if you're involved in DXE, just so people can know. Um, reach out to them. But most importantly, implement them in your personal life. Have a difficult conversation with your stubborn friend who still eats animals. Reach out to the lonely vegan and form a dynamic duo. And finally, inspire others to do the same, because the animals know it, need it more than ever. All right, thank you. Sorry that went a little bit longer, apologies. Sorry that went a little bit longer. Okay, so um, you may have noticed that this is not Katie Cantrell. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, uh, Katie was in a car accident this morning. She's okay, but her car is not. <laughs> um, so she was having to deal with all of that. And uh, luckily, uh, Aaron Paul is here to step in for her for Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. So thank you, Aaron. Hello, everybody. So yes, as you can, as, as she mentioned, as Hope mentioned, uh, Katie is not here. So normally, we would be more prepared, and we would also have many cute cat pictures as well to be a part of our presentation. <laughs> but unfortunately, you're just going to have to look at me for seven minutes. Um, so I can just give you a little bit of background about what the FFAC, the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition, is and how we do our work and why we believe that's effective. Um, so the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition started about five years ago with Katie Cantrell being the director of the organization. Um, the model that we use is essentially going into any group in wherever we have a director, whether it's in the Bay Area or Portland or Toronto or elsewhere, and give a presentation about all the aspects of factory farming. We take a holistic approach. We go into whether it's high schools, colleges, faith groups, really anywhere you want. If you want to have us into your living room because you have 10 friends who are vegan, not vegan, just interested in the issue, we'll come and give a free presentation. Um, so that's a big piece of our work. Um, the holistic approach is that while we are definitely um, animal rights activists, and that is a, a large part of what we do, we talk about the suffering of animals, we really try and engage people and feel that the best way to get people into this cause is to engage them in all the ways that you can possibly um, sort of connect with veganism. So whether it's animal rights, um, we talk to workers' rights groups, so we'll talk to um, Latino Americans who are working within the, the workers, uh, working in some of these slaughterhouses, um, going to poor communities and talking about food justice issues. So we're talking about um, food deserts, particularly in Oakland. You have a lot of communities that um, talking about vegan or animal veganism from an animal rights perspective is something that culturally is not um, necessarily the best way to connect. So we do have a piece that's sort of about food deserts and that kind of thing. Um, just to give you an example, over the last three months, we've talked to about 1,000 people, most of them being students, a lot of them high school students, some college. And over the last three years, it's been about 7,000 people. Um, so yeah, it really is about that, that intersectionality and making sure that everybody can connect with the issue um, in the way that they feel um, best. Um, the next piece of our work that we do is follow up speaker trainings. Um, so not just having people come to our training and then not having anything to do afterwards. What we want to do is empower people to go out and give the presentation themselves. So we do really feel the education work is important. We find, I've given the, given the presentation only a few times myself, but we find that a lot of the work we do is you really need to do that basic work. It seems like when you're in a vegan community, when you're in a room like this, we have a lot of supporters, a lot of people who are really passionate about animals and want to get out and do really important work, and that's great. But there's a lot of people who really, as, as the video we just watched show, really don't have a lot of that basic information. Um, so. We do, we, for instance, we did the BART um, campaign where we talked about how um, cattle have to be pregnant at all times to produce milk. And the general population does not know that, th that kind of information. So we really do think that the basis of our work has to be that basic education and getting out to different communities. And then empowering people who really enjoyed the presentation and want to get involved to go out and then present themselves. Um, the third piece, which is a new thing that we're just getting involved in now, is um, We've connected with an organization that's based in Hong Kong, but it's moving to um, to the United States. And Katie is actually going to be the, the sort of conduit for that group for the entire country. Um, it's an organization called Green Monday, which is to try and make institutional change with this work. 
So going in and giving a primary presentation about factory farming, all the aspects of it, but then trying to follow up either in a high school to try and change the menus that they're going to be having, um, try and change just the, the eating habits, and really press that the idea is that it's a positive thing, that it's a good change for your either company or high school or group to be involved in, and then to try and branch out from there. Um, so generally, that's, that's, our, uh, that's the model we use, is through education, trying to empower people individually to then give presentations themselves, and to try and create a community through that. And we're also involved, as Brian was talking about, um, how important it is to have community and create that. Um, we're involved, one of the main organizers of Oakland Veg Week, which is happening at the end of April. Hopefully everybody can come. Um, which is eight days of events, um, all vegan-based events happening all over the East Bay, mostly in Oakland itself, culminating on Saturday, April 25th, with a Oakland Veg Fest that's going to be free samples. It's right by Lake Merritt BART, so we wanted to make sure it's accessible to everybody in the community. It's entirely free to come. So far, we've gotten somewhere around five or 6,000 samples, free samples, from all kinds of companies all over the country. And then we're also going to have um, food for sale, um, advocate organizations, all that kind of stuff. So that's really another big piece of our work, is getting out into the community with big public events and making sure people from different communities. And because we, we are representing Berkeley and Oakland, we want to make sure that the, the many communities that are interested in veganism or just getting involved in animal rights or workers' rights have a place to connect in one central place. So I have two minutes left, but that was already perfect, so I'm just going <laughs> to sit down now. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you so much for just jumping in. I mean, he did just wonderful, wonderful that he was able to do that. Oh, yeah, good job, good job. Okay, so our next speaker, come on up, is Mary Finelli, and we heard from her earlier, and uh, yay, here she is. <laughs> Well, I'm going to do more of a, a general approach to activism, um, issues within activism, good and bad. And um, there, there really is no one good, one perfect or one right approach to activism. Um, it's really going to, different approaches are going to appeal to different people. And of course, you have to do things that you feel you're capable of doing and where your talents lie. I know there was a, um, a concept put out a little while ago, some time ago, that the best thing everybody could do was get a job on Wall Street and make a lot of money and donate it to animal rights. And <laughs> I just thought that was so crazy. For one thing, you know, what would you be um, promoting in your job on Wall Street? And, and not everybody is, is capable of, of being a Wall Street whiz. So I thought that was kind of crazy. But um, certainly all genuine efforts are admirable. Um, but some could actually be counterproductive. So we have to... Um, take care in that. And uh, an example I'll give you is, I think like at the first UPC conference, um, Karen had, she presented two contrasting videos. And they were both um, direct action videos where people went into, uh, one was a lab and another was factory farm. And in the first video, it was, I think, all young guys. And they went in there and they had masks on their face and there was techno music playing as the, the theme music to the video. And they were going in, I can't remember exactly, but as I can recall, they were like kicking in doors and spraying graffiti, and um, all, and then they were carrying some animals out in, in containers, but you couldn't really see the animals. And the focus really was on the activists, and the animals were just incidental. And then, in contrast to that, was a, a video of um, I think it was compassion over killing. They went into um, a factory farm, and they their faces were exposed. It was open action, and they were you know lovingly carrying these birds out and uh, no music, I don't think there was any music to it, but it was just such a contrast to see the, this um, uh, violent action in the first one, and then this really loving action in the second, and uh, I think um, you know, the, the focus always has to be on the animals or whatever you're, the, the environment, whatever issue you're addressing. Um, uh, and, and of course, it's important to try to reach people in ways that they're gonna be receptive to, um, like for example, in timing, um, er early on, one of the first veg fests that we had in D.C., we were having it on the National Mall, but on the Ellipse, which is kind of a, a way, um, not it's a little more remote area. And on the main mall, they were having a big family reunion celebration. And so we thought, well, we'll go there and leaflet and try to draw people over to the veg fest. And I remember I was standing in line to, it was like um, a barbecue or something, and I was trying to get people, instead of buying the barbecue, to go over to the veg fest. 
And, and people said, you know, these people are already, their mouths are salivating, you know, they're kind of a lost cause. It'd be better if you went and, and appealed to people who were think, considering what to have to eat. So I don't know if that was really the case or not, but, you know, something to bear in mind. Another thing is the circus. Were, um, it was just in town, the circus. And so some people were having a leafleting and protest before people went in, and other people were having it after. And, um, you know, the idea was these people already have their tickets. They're going in. They're, they're already invested in the circus. So are you really going to dissuade them? And other people said, well, you know, they're, they're kind of a captive audience because they're here standing in line waiting to go in. So you give them the leaflet, something to read. And they'll be thinking about it as, watch the, as they watch these acts. So, you know, which is right, or if maybe there, it's good to go before and after if you can get the people, but something to bear in mind, try to time it right. And, and also language is a big issue, and I'm all for liberating our language and using language that's going to be non-specious and appealing, but I think you can go overboard on that. For example, um, a lot of, I'm often asked, why don't you call it fishes feel? And I just think this, the word fishes sounds so much like fishies. And people already, it's hard enough to get people to start taking um, animal rights seriously and, and, and thinking about fish as sentient beings. And I, I just think that would, it's overly PC. I think the people we're trying to reach would, would, wouldn't really take it well. So that's why we don't call it fishies, fishes feel. <laughs> And then um, I think also, similar to what Karen had been addressing, e extremes, if you're uh, really rigid in your approach, can be a, a real turnoff. Um, for example, uh, Veg News, they have a Facebook page, and they often put up a, a product. And it seems like whatever product they put up there, there's going to be somebody who's going to come on and say, you know, is there some minuscule ingredient in there that's problematic? Or who owns this company? And what are their business practices and is it organic or does it have GMOs and even is it meat like if it's something meat like then we don't want to be promoting that and I really we're trying to get as is often said we're not trying to be a vegan club we're trying to be a vegan society so we really need to try to um, have a broader mind than that and really appeal to the to the masses um, let's see also also getting back to what Karen had addressed um, the single issue approach um, I had actually been invited to be a speaker at the Vegan Expo, and then when, when it was made known that, which was nothing I was trying to hide, that there are some welfare reforms that I am in favor of, I was disinvited to go. Um, and, uh, it's, you know, and, and the problem with that is that there really is a big following to this kind of Stalinistic thinking, which is kind of what it is. You know, people just are, are, um, are banished or um, cut off, and, and it, that really has a popular appeal. And, you really need to have critical thinking. You have to not owe your allegiance to a certain organization or individual, but really our allegiance should be to the animals who we're supposed to be advocating on behalf of. And, and a lot of these single issue um, campaigns, they are abolitionistic in nature. If we can get um, gestation crates abolished, that is abolitionistic. If we can get the use of chickens in caporis abolished, that, that is abolitionistic. It's incremental ab abolitionism. Um, let's see, and legislation is a great way to go. But of course, you know, it can be, um, it can always be overturned. And also, um, a lot of legislation becomes so conciliatory, so compromised that it's, it's really not very meaningful when it comes down to it, or it might not have any enforcement teeth, or it could block really meaningful legislation in, in the future. <coughs> what I think is really the biggest problem that we're facing now, and I was really glad to see that video uh, that Hope showed, is. Um, this, the, the notion that you can have humane animal agriculture products because there's really no way to commodify an animal and have it be humane. You know, just think to yourself, is this something that I would, if it was done to me, would I consider that humane? Um, and really, what we really need to have is a moral imperative that not eating animals is a moral imperative. It's not just um, that you can eat these animals instead of these animals, but we shouldn't be using these animals as, as commodities. And... Uh, um, okay, uh, a big issue that, uh, just within the issue of fish, um, like uh, there's organizations that have a boycott Canadian seafood while the seal hunt is going on. But what does that, what's the message that that's giving that, that it's okay to eat seafood otherwise and once the seal hunt ends, fish and other aquatic animals are a fair game? It's just, um, it's just the, you know, it's the wrong approach. It, it's really selling out animals. And, and as far as activism, there's, there's so many great ways that we can help in your everyday life. You know, if you see comments online, you can post comments to, in response to articles or, or 
blogs. Um, you can write letters to the editor, call in to, to talk shows. There's so many ways we can be active. And ideally, I think uh, the more upbeat we can be, the more positive, um, you know, present vegan living as, as being the joyous life it can be. And um, uh, uh, just, you know, whatever you feel is your most, uh, the most, the best way you can use your talents that will help animals. So um, is this on? Got it? Um, can you hear? OK, wonderful. OK, so we're just going to open it up for questions. And so if I could ask, um, you're welcome to give your perspective as well. We'd love to hear that. But keep it minimal. Um, let's not have a whole nother presentation. Um, so just you're welcome to, you know, to say what you want to say. Uh, but also, uh, if you can focus in on some kind of question or some kind of something to um, to bring out dialogue in the in the panelists. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brian, I will re request a comment from you. Sure. Um, I saw a webinar a couple months ago. Uh, it was a one-hour webinar with Nick Cooney and with Dr. Melina Eschrick. By the way, uh, Melina is here uh, today. And uh, so it was talking about some things uh, about, uh, based on studies about effectiveness of uh, certain techniques of reaching people, getting people to uh, change their attitudes, to change, to change their ideas. Um, and it, uh, it said that it's effective to approach people with uh, presenting your idea in a way so that it's not so very, di not so very different from what they already believe. OK, so that's one thing. The other thing is uh, they, they found it's effective to challenge the person to make a commitment to make a change in their personal life, to make some change in their personal life, even though it's not uh, very radical, may, maybe very rather limited, but yet it's something to get them off dead center, to get them moving in the direction of humane change. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I don't know if or how these ideas relate to what DXC does. My dear friends in DXC, my very beloved friends in DXC, I, I've uh, participated in a, in a couple of DXC actions. And uh, uh, do you have a comment? Yeah, so. Oh, sorry. Hello. Yeah. Is this <laughs> a little bit too loud. Is it, is it possible if I just. No, actually, use it because we're recording that. it for the video would be good. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, so I'd, I'd say two things. Uh, the first is that the the kind of psychological nature of the change that we're trying to create often demands different tactics. Um, and the second is that I'd I'd say we're yeah we're we're trying to create a, a kind of societal change that's very different from the individual change for which those things might be effective. Um, so the the first the first thing that I'd comment is you know. Personally, I haven't read much into these studies, but if, if I remember correctly, some of the studies that they used to cite this as, as kind of the kind of uh, paradigm th uh, with which you should go forward for activism, um, it, it relates to getting people to make you know, fairly small changes that don't necessarily challenge very fundamental beliefs that they have. Um, so maybe you know committing to donating more a little bit to an organization. By the way, I'm, I'm basically paraphrasing what Sapphire said at a, at a DXC open meeting um, fairly recently about the psychology of welfareism. She studied psychology at UC Berkeley, so I'm, I'm literally just kind of saying what she said. Um, so you should also talk to her more after this if you're curious about the subject. Um, so the first thing is that, you know, uh, these ideas and these methods may only be effective for kind of getting people to do things that don't require a major psychological shift. So, for example, you know, most people think that, for example, the environment is a good thing and we shouldn't like totally destroy the environment. So, you know, some of these uh, methods of kind of incrementally getting people to do a little bit um, might be good to get them to start donating a little bit more to environmental causes. Um, what we're trying to do at DXE is to very much change the fundamental way in which we see and interact with animals. 
And often that requires extraordinary disruption because the fact of the matter is, is that for, for most people in the world, um, speciesism is a reality uh, and it's an unquestioned reality. And it takes a very strong, not necessarily hostile, but strong message to jolt them out of that. Um, the second thing I'd say, and I think this comes up a lot with DXE, is that um, there's, there's often a large contrast between what DXE tries to do um, and what I'd say most other animal rights organizations are trying to do. Um, I'd say I, most, just like super broad brushstrokes here, I'd say a lot of other animal rights organizations are trying to change indiv individuals, so trying to uh, change kind of individual behavior, getting more people to go vegan. Um, and while this is certainly a goal for DXE, it's, it's much more of a secondary goal. Our primary goal, well, I'd say we have two primary goals. Um, the first is to create activists. The second, and this is kind of the important one for this discussion, is to create society level conversations. So think of things like hash, uh, you know, hashtag Black Lives Matter or Occupy Wall Street. We want to kind of create these large controversies and these large, um, almost thoughts in the zeitgeist um, for animal rights. And, and doing, doing those things are very different. So, you know, it could be very much the case that those methods of ad advocacy are very effective for changing individual vegans. Um, but it also may be the case that what DXE is doing is very effective for kind of creating these large societal level conversations. And in fact, I wouldn't even say it may be the case. Um, I'd say like, you know, historically, su su successful social justice movements and kind of our history with DXE in the past, just the, kind of the, the press attention that we've provoked, have indicated that, um, you know, these more disruptive tactics are very effective at, at generating society level dialogue about animal rights. So that kind of ends my rant. Okay. Um, <laughs> does anyone else on the panel want to say anything, or should we move on to a quest another question? I mean, I guess I can speak to that to a certain degree, but I think we're probably going to fall in the category of sort of the other animal rights organizations. Um, a lot of a lot of what we do is about it. it it's not necessarily just about that individual um, change, but since we are speaking to a lot of youth, we're talking to a lot of people who are in impoverished or bad eating situations, talking to a lot of people of color. Um, that sort of direct action, I mean, totally support it, think it's awesome, um, might not always appeal to those same communities because we get a lot of, uh, it's not, we're not fighting, I love you. But, but, but we, we tend to have a lot of people who um, haven't heard about the issue at all. So this might be their first interaction even thinking like, where does my food come from? And so a lot of that is the community we want to build might be the community that you build first and then they might be then ready to build into your community. And the community we want to build is like a safe space to talk about this if you have problems with your family who aren't willing to um, accept the fact that you're going to change your eating habits. Um, make sure we have lots of follow-up materials for them. Make sure we have speaker trainings. We have like community events that they can come to and become volunteers. And then hopefully the next step, I mean, this is maybe not, I'm just going to speak from my own standpoint. We need lots of direct action people. But I think sometimes, especially when you're talking with youth or different communities, you need to get people just to even know what the issue is, that people haven't even heard it yet, and maybe not skip too many steps. OK, great. Another question? Uh, this is for the panel, generally. Um, it's just about the whole Gary Francione issue of single issue campaigns. Um, and I totally, th this has been a, a great uh, time. It's been a, a great conversation for me to hear um, around him because I, I found I was particularly attracted to listening to him in the beginning after my conversion to veganism. Um, but I very quickly came around to the idea that it's pretty fascistic, his approach, and I really didn't like it. So I'm really very grateful to the, for the conversation here today around this whole thing. But I had one question that I think he, he'd proposed to be a reason against single issue campaigns, and that is that it makes the population um, at large more complacent. Say, for instance, um, an issue like the farrowing crates for, for pigs, if they're abolished, then the, the, the perception out there is that, oh, pigs are having a much easier life now, so it's sort of okay for me to eat them. What, what would you say about that? Um, well, I would say that, uh, you know, we have to always make it known that that's not the goal. 
is to abolish gestation crates, but really the, the goal is to abolish harmful animal exploitation. So uh, I think there is a concern with giving people easy outs and saying that you don't have to do much. You know, maybe just eat these other animal products or something like that. We really do need a radical change in society, um, but we can present it as, as a positive change and that, you know, it's better for the animals, for us, for the environment. So it's a win-win-win situation for all. Um, but I think I think Gary Francione has had some very good ideas. He has he does have some very good ideas, but I think he takes them to extremes. Yeah. Anyone else on the panel want to comment on that? Sure. Is it All okay? right. Please go for it's it. Gonna, while I'm up here, I mean, you guys gave me a mic, so. Um, <laughs> I think the the one issue campaign is very interesting. The one thing that comes to my mind is we had some Arizona activists who approached us because of um, the issue of foie gras, which probably most vegans are aware of, sort of force feeding geese. Um, that there was a, a lot of um, action in California to get that banned. And what's happened is almost all those operations are now on the Arizona, Arizona side of the border within 10 miles of California because they're still shipping it back because the consumers are the wealthy in California. So that's kind of the when you talk about a locality or a one issue thing, you have to make sure for, from my standpoint that you place in a larger context. The FFAC generally, I mean, the thing that we're interested in is um, I wouldn't say we're necessarily an anti-capitalist organization, although I am an anti-capitalist person, but <laughs> is that like you have to place it into that larger context, right? So um, eating, I'm going to just say straight out, this is just an, this is me talking right now. But from my standpoint, um, if you're eating vegan food that is uh, processed food, that is um, very unhealthy food, that's contributing to obesity, that is um, made by giant corporations that make other products that are heavily intensive in terms of egg, dairy, and, and meat usage, that that's a contradiction in terms and you need to try and look at it in its totality and all the aspects of factory farming and how it affects people's lives, not just animal rights. Animal rights are very important, but it has to be placed in a larger context, I think. I really actually don't have much more yeah, to that's say. Totally that's, yeah, that's totally fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. And I'd like to say too that, you know, and this is a, a panel of experts, but we're all kind of experts to a degree, and if someone has something that they want to comment on from someone else's question, you're welcome to do that, too. So, um, anyway, uh, okay. I'm gonna go up high. Hi. Was it you? Two things. I've noticed in my conversations that respect for animals or shall I say disrespect for animals, is coupled to disrespect for people, and um, also a belief that people cannot really have good health on a vegan diet. They believe deeply that they need their meat. So my recommendation in asking if you are approaching people this way in your actions is that you address both these concerns. Go ahead, Brian. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so I think, again, this is more kind of addressing the individual getting people to go vegan rather than kind of more societal level stuff. So again, this is not as much what DXC is focused on. I, I think there are, there are two important parts towards making a, a decision. Um, the first is the ease of, of, of that decision, right? And I think that's kind of what you're addressing. So the decision to, you know, change your beliefs, change your behavior around animals. Um, but the, the second is kind of the pressure that's forcing you to do that. Um, direct action everywhere mostly just focuses on the second in part because there are so many other great groups uh, working on the first component of that, making sure that there are lots of vegan products available, um, you know, making sure that people know about you know, vegan health, whatever. Um, and, and this is all a really good thing. This is actually one thing I do want to emphasize is I feel like, uh, I hope this, this panel is not like some kind of gladiator pit where we're kind of pitted against each other of, of kind of the no, best forms of activism. Not, that's not what we yeah, wanted at all. Cause, cause it's I, just to present a, a variety of yeah. Yes. Be because I, I really, I re <laughs> did you just stab me? That was, that was not fair. I did not. 
because I just I think as a general phenomenon, um, you know, and it's very unfortunate that we see it this way in the animal rights movement. That I think as a general phenomenon, these these things are are pitted as as dichotomies. Like, do you you know talk about health, or you know do you kind of pressure people more about animal rights or something? When really I think they do work a lot more uh, together. Um, so that's 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 all I have to say on the subject. Yeah, and just to uh, comment on what um, Brian said, I mean, we kind of chose the panel uh, to be very diverse. We just wanted a diversity of opinions and uh, perspectives. Um, and yeah, it's not, it, you know, we, we knew you guys would be respectful. It's all, we all love each other, yeah, yeah so it's right. wonderful. <laughs> I've been chatting all day, it's good One stuff. One big vegan family. Yes, <laughs> which is important. Um, so in our work, I mean, I think maybe your question is a little bit more directed to our organization and the work we do. Um, a lot of what we do is not necessarily advocating a vegan diet as a, um, the be all and end all, number one, but it's also that that transition can take time. And so we talk to, especially again when we're talking to school groups, we talk about um, the gradual transition and that maybe um, a vegan diet or looking at the way you eat your food is the most important thing. And then hopefully transitioning to a vegan diet, but allowing people to connect to it in that kind of short term way, even if it's a you know meatless Monday or, or a green Monday or eating meat less, whatever. If that's an intermediate step, we think that that's still a positive step. Um, in terms of the protein question, we do presentations everywhere. That's the number one. I mean, uh, we're all vegans in this, or a lot of vegans in this room. I'm sure we've all been asked 10,000 times where you get your protein and stuff from that from. So a lot of the work we do, um, we do uh, nutritional training so that people can get that kind of basic information about um, combining proteins with vitamin C and all those kind of things. So that is really important to our work because we want to be that group that people feel comfortable approaching with really basic questions that that lonely vegan that you showed up there, sometimes the loneliness is not that you don't have other people who support it, but did you just have a little question and you don't want to Google it. You want to be able to talk to a human person about those different issues. I would just add, I mean, if someone is really saying that you're putting non-human animals over human animals because of you know, dietary recommendation, um, the American Association of Dietetics and the Canadian Dietetic Association, and I believe the Australian Dietetic Association, they have position papers that show at state that a uh, vegetarian diet is uh, appropriate for all life stages and is nu nutritionally adequate and can actually stave off a lot of de degenerative diseases. So it's a, it is a healthier diet, not only for the animals, but for human health as well. And also, of course, a lot of animal agriculture contributes to greenhouse gases and is bad for the environment, and that ultimately is bad for human health, which is um, the position that the dietetic guidelines committee for the U.S. nutrition guidelines is trying to promote, has come forward, that's in their recommendations that we should be getting away from a meat-based diet for a plant-based, towards a plant-based diet for environmental causes as well. So it is for human, human benefit as well. I'd okay. like to add something to that. Sure. Andrea. So we actually have a vegan bodybuilding um, fitness gym here, I believe in Oakland, led by Ed Bauer. Uh, definitely check out veganbodybuilding.com. Um, and then there's an amazing photographer by the name of Melissa Schwartz. She has a series going on called V Girls and V Guys. She goes around photographing celebrities who are bodybuilders, um, like, or for instance, also Steve O from Jackass. Um, and just the whole, all these plant based bodybuilding teams that are out there. She's out there photographing them, and I aspire to do what she's doing, but I have other visions. Um, Melissa Schwartz. Melissa, Melissa Schwartz. Okay. And another question? Oh, yeah. Well, also, I think, isn't there um, Humane Athlete as a website that just lets you know all these amazing athletes that are, are vegan? Yeah. During, just quickly, during Oakland Veg Week, we're also having the vegan bodybuilding, the gym is partnered with us, and we're having a fitness Sunday so that you can get, if you're interested in that kind of fitness side, and we have a former uh, qualified for the Olympics athlete who's going to be speaking at one of the events as well, so check out the website. Hi, so can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, can, I have two questions actually, but before that I have a quick comment. I want to say hats off to UPC for putting together such a fabulous day. Um, 
I I was here last year uh, as well, and uh, in my experience, I learned more in one day here than I would do on my personal reading in the whole entire year. Clearly, I'm not reading enough, but still, that says a lot. Okay, uh, now to my uh, questions. Uh, you know, I work with hardcore carnivores. Some of my best friends are carnivores, and whenever I try to have a discussion with them, I come across a couple of questions repeatedly, and I am at the end of my wits as to how to answer them. So I clearly need some help. So uh, one of the things that they repeatedly tell me is that it's the fault of the meat industry to have those practices, and they should fix it. In the meantime, I am going to eat meat. Giving up meat is a tremendous sacrifice to me. So these people are basically passing the buck to the meat industry to fix their malpractices instead of taking the responsibility on their own shoulders to do something instead of that. That is one thing, and I don't quite know what argument, uh, what counter argument to present to that. Um, and then the second thing that I come across uh, from these people is that there is a hierarchy in the animal kingdom, and each animal earns its right to live accordingly. For example, cockroaches are filthy, and they deserve to die. Chickens and pigs are somewhere in there, and I care much less about their life. So it's almost like denying a right to live to certain species. And I am wondering what one could say to things like these. Um, to the first question, I think um, one of the things that we work on is, like I said before, I'm anti-capitalist, fuck capitalism. But at the same time, um, you can vote with your, you can have some effect on these companies. So what's really interesting, if you're talking about the meat industry, is there are a couple really interesting examples of companies that are producing vegan food and really good stuff that's sustainable, uh, like Field Roast, for instance, that is being run by meat eaters. And that's, uh, from my perspective, that might not be the most ideal situation, but it's good to see that that's a way you can maybe affect those meat industries, right? Is if you start using alternative sources of protein and stop buying their products, they're going to have to come up with an alternative of what they're going to make because they're scumbags trying to make as much money as possible. So you want to have, you want to support companies, obviously, you want to support companies that um, are sustainable, but by not putting your money into those programs, you're going to stop their, you're, you're, you are making a change with your money. Yeah, I, I just had a more general uh, comment about, about the nature of these kind of interactions. At, at least in my experience, um, you know, I've been a vegan for a while, and I think that um, even if you answer every one of those arguments, there's just going to be 10 more that pop up. I mean, what's, what's the myth with Hercules where, like, you know, there's this hydra or something. I guess it's kind of speciesist, but he, he's pitted against this hydra, and each time he chops off one of the heads of the hydra, like three heads pop up again, right? This is how I feel sometimes with some of these arguments. Um, so I think, you know, it's often important to step back and, and re-engage how you're, how you're dealing with it. And, and one, one way that I changed a lot in, in how I engage with these kind of people um, was when I actually first got involved with Direct Action Everywhere a few years ago. Um, before that, I'd kind of taken the, the uh, more standard advice of, of being very, you know, just not really pushing the issue terribly much, um, you know, encouraging much more kind of small steps. And I think what this did is it, it caused them to uh, not understand the, the seriousness of the issue. And it causes them to bring up all of these, you know, trivial concerns, right? Um, I, I changed my approach um, a few years ago, and, and, and I found actually that it was extraordinarily effective. Um, so I wasn't necessarily mean, but I, I just started to be honest with people, and, you know, saying like, no, this is wrong, instead of necessarily dodging around some of these issues, just saying, no, there is no such thing as a species hierarchy. Um, I even, one thing that I've done that I was empowered to do because a lot of my friends have started doing is I've turned my veganism into more of an act of uh, political protest by not just not eating animals, but uh, refusing to eat when others at the table are also eating animals. Um, and yeah, and thanks to all those who like are doing that too, because it's it's really powerful. And I think it's start it's something that's starting to happen in the vegan and animal rights movement. Um, it's starting to catch on. Um, I would highly recommend it. As a result, like 
it w it's so strange. I didn't necessarily, you know, I just as a result of being more serious about this, all of these small little arguments went away, and people tended to understand much more the gravity of the issue. Consequently, um, sure, there were quite a few people who were turned off, um, but I'd say, at least in my high school, for example, I'd say as a result, roughly 20% of the class went vegetarian um, as a result of advocating this in, in this style, um, just being honest. Um, so I'd highly recommend doing that to anyone who has to deal with this kind of giant dictionary of all of the stupid arguments against animal rights. And I'm curious what, what you mean by being honest, like instead of s addressing specific things that they're addressing, you say. Oh, that's tricky. Um, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I would say. So like into the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> I, w I would have say, you know, hey, I, I really love you, but I object to what's going on right now. You know, the, the consumption of an animal's body is inherently violent, and I don't want to take part in it. Um, as a result, I'm going to leave the dinner table, um, and I hope to join you soon, or something like that. I mean, that's, that's something of what I'd say usually. Um, you know, it's not, it's not like, oh, you're an awful person. I, you know, I think, I think DXC sometimes gets that rap, by the way, as kind of the mean group, but it's like, we really try to avoid that. Uh, we just try to, you know, be very straightforward, loving, but honest. Um, so. Thank you, yeah. I, just one little point on that. I, I'll get to Mary in a second. Um, a lot of the work we do is because we're talking to people who otherwise haven't dealt with these issues. We get a lot of these questions. We get a lot of questions, you know, the desert island question, or what about that goat that they really love that goat, you know, before that one goat on that one farm? Like, you know, there is that ethical idea. And really what we do as part of our training, too, when, when you go out and speak to deal with these Q&A, is really directing it to the main issue, which is that 99% of American animals are slaughtered in factory farming. And so all these kind of little extra extraneous details that they're trying to nitpick and they're trying to get you to, you know, that aha question they're trying to ask you is just keep um, focusing on the main point, which is the animals and how many of them and what a huge system this is. I'll just make a couple quick points. Um, it's interesting that your friends are putting the, the responsibility on the meat industry because so often what the meat industry says is we're just providing what consumers want. Mm -hmm. Of course, they don't take into account or they do, they don't mention that they're bombarding people with advertisements of sa animals saying how much they want to be eaten and all, so, and all that propaganda. <laughs> um, and also, you know, I don't like to refer to people as carnivores because people aren't carnivores. They're, they're omnivorous. We have choice. We can decide what we want to eat and we can thrive on a um, vegan diet and all the nutrients we need to thrive you can get from plant sources. And as far as these basic questions, so often people say, well, if you're killing plants, aren't you? You know, I know on the UPC site they have um, um, 13 answers to 13 common questions and there's a, a number of different um, places online that you can find. Um, I know on Robert Grillo's site also Humane. Um, Free from harm, thank you. He has a very good um, list of responses to these very common questions that you get. And sometimes I think people are, are seriously think these things and it gets tiring. Like I, I often respond to people online, how often you encounter these, but you know, I just try to think of people as being genuine in their questions, so I try to patiently answer them or almost childlike and you have to explain it to them. And, and even if they're being facetious, somebody else might read that who really will take Take that to heart and, and hear what you have to say. I have in my fridge right now. So now you're saying that that's not, I was, what do you mean by that when you said it's like not a good thing to have all those main like smart dogs and you know those companies, are you saying that those are just as bad? Well, I'm not saying those companies are just as bad. I'm sorry if I was unclear before. Um, I think that a lot of those companies, as long as you, you do research on what the individual companies are. I mean, it, from my standpoint, um, a lot of these companies are um, excellent companies that are making great products for the right reasons, but there are other companies that are making a single vegan product in their line or they're making a single tofu product in their line um, as sort of to, to, catch, to catch a market. So for, from my standpoint, it's just about researching companies that are really passionate about this issue and wanting to support that kind of industry. Um, and, and again, in terms of so a lot of people are interested in veganism for health reasons um, to try and avoid some of the more processed foods. Because you can, s there's a lot of like Oreo cookies are vegan, for instance. And a lot of people don't know that. They're, they're junk food and they're, they use palm oil. But they're, 
some people would eat those because they're vegan. This is, this is a very big debate, but my personal standpoint is that you should try and avoid those processed big company foods and just support the little companies as much as you can. If, if I can also add kind of an alternative perspective on some of these issues. Um, vegans make up maximum one to two percent of the current population. The um, economic forces that we are up against are, while relatively small compared to other industries, very large. Animal agriculture makes up roughly half a percent of GDP. Um, and as a result, I think that within the animal rights movement, we, we place a lot of emphasis on kind of um, the importance of consumer choices. And consumer choices are important because I think, you know, if you are a self consistent animal rights activist or animal rights act advocate, like you should not eat someone's dead body. You know, you should, you should respect their body. Um, but I think that, uh, I think that we, we often undercredit the extent to which we have other forms of power over these industries and over these, uh, you know, legal and cultural institutions. Um, historically, these, these social justice movements have not succeeded through a kind of large boycott efforts, in part because they just, the movements are too small to have, you know, any tangible economic impact. I mean, Erica Chenoweth has found that very, she's a political scientist at uh, the University of Colorado Boulder, that the most successful uh, movements usually comprise roughly like one to two percent of the population, and these are movements that succeed in overthrowing governments. Um, so what you know we have to do is much less than that. Um, you know these movements do not have terribly much economic power, but how they win is through social power. Um, and I think that it's very important for us to try to keep that in mind because often in the animal rights movement we we just kind of get wrapped up in all these little like consumer dialogues that I personally don't think matter that much. And I think what what is much more important than uh, your individual consumer behavior is how strongly you're speaking up for animals in your social network um, and you know how, how seriously you're bringing that message out. Um, so the, the social impact I think is very important is often neglected uh, in these consumer dialogues. Yeah. Uh, I would want okay, oh. so yeah. well, we're running out of time. Let's get, try to get one more question in. Okay. Or did, did you really want to? Well, maybe you could talk to her after. Yeah, if you want to oh. come talk to me <laughs> afterwards about those issues and <laughs> helping with those kind of basic one stuff. One last question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, as you just mentioned, the, uh, the number of uh, percentage of vegans, vegetarians in the population is 1% to 2%. And I've seen numbers that say the number of former vegans, vegetarians is about 10%. My question for the panel is, what strategies do you think would be most effective to help people to, to stay, if they try this diet, uh, to, to stay with it? Well, I mean, I think uh, in terms of what Brian and I have been saying, I think we do have some overlap on this, and, and Miriam, um, I believe as well. I'm not sure how, you, how much your organization talks about dietary choices and that kind of thing, so you can speak to this more. But I really think it does have a lot to do with creating community, and it really does have to do with making sure that um, we have outlets for people to um, talk, voice their concerns. There are, by the way, as vegans, I know this is like a you know, thing that people don't like to talk about, but there are real dietary things that people do need to talk about. You know, people do need to worry about their B12 intake and iron, and it's not enough to tell new vegans, and I think this is what a lot of people do, is that just do it, it's amazing. And it is, but you do need to pay a lot of attention to that. So that is important. So I think that's something, having that like nutritional side support, um, having a community support, people to talk to and share that information with is, is really the, the main way I feel like we can really grow a strong vegan movement with lots of people from really diverse communities is trying to reach out to all different people and create a community with each other. And I think also if you can, you know, really educate people about as far as what's happening to animals. A lot of people become vegetarian or vegan for health reasons or environmental, but once I think once they, if they really empathize with the animals, it's going to be a lot harder for them to just not stop caring. You know? Okay. Well, thanks you, thank you everyone um, for being here. This has been a wonderful day, um, just uh, uh, an amazing event. Um, please fill out your surveys. 
please donate to UPC or uh, Animal Place to offset the cost if you can. And um, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.